Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Inesh, uh, Inesh Koye, and I'm a third year medical student at Anglo Rask University um, in Chelmsford in the UK. Uh, since uh, about January, I've been doing an internship with the Synapse Centre for Neurodevelopment in Colchester, investigating advances in um, autism spectrum disorder and sort of just investigating uh, management and um, diagnosis and just learning a little bit more about that. And Dr. Theo uh, Herodes is a professor of pharmacology and internal medicine. He's our guest today. Um, he's our uh, he's also the director of molecular uh, hemo immunopharmacology and drug discovery in the Department of Humanology Humo at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston in the United States. Um, just a little bit more about him. He received all his degrees from Yale, uh, which awarded him the Dean's Research Award um, in, in pathology. He has published over 470 scientific papers uh, and he's uh, placed in the world's top 200% of the most cited authors. And today, uh, with no further ado, um, just introducing him again, he's going to be delivering us a lecture on the role of mast cells in inflammation of the brain and a little bit more about autism spectrum disorder. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation and introduction. I'm sorry if you're seeing a TypeScript at the bottom of the slides, but uh, we couldn't get rid of it. Um, you can see pretty much everything I will uh, discuss today on the site mustcellmaster.com. And if there is urgent uh, need for anybody to get in touch with me, that Gmail address works actually easier than the university address that gets usually flooded with emails. So. Let me start with a few facts that might be well known to everybody, but just to uh, get us into perspective. Uh, recent data from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta in January 2022 indicated that one in about 44 children are likely to be diagnosed with autism. I mean, in my mind, that's a real pandemic. And we still have a lot to do to decipher uh, what is happening, let alone potentially help these children. There are a few important facts with this light. Uh, number one, there's no pathogenesis known. Uh, number two, obviously, there are no effective treatments. Uh, needless to say, the economic burden, at least in the United States, is pretty high. But most importantly, as you can see at the bottom, uh, autism presents with medical comorbidities. Many of them uh, are known, such as allergies, uh, GI problems, hyperactivity, mitochondrial dysfunction, seizures. So taking into consideration that every child is different, and then you add the comorbidities on top of it, it becomes almost impossible to be able to get statistical significance in uh, results, uh, let alone try to do a clinical trial, since uh, the conformity, if you wish, uh, to certain criteria will be very difficult. Now, we published many years ago in BMC Pediatrics uh, this little review about perinatal stress, brain inflammation, and risk of autism. And uh, even though that was published in 2012, uh, uh, we are 10 years later, we're still struggling to understand exactly what we had sort of proposed uh, back then. Uh, you can see the caricature taken from that journal that clearly a number of factors could uh, enter into the equation from maternal infection, placental dysfunction, um, susceptibility uh, by genes, autoimmunity, brain autoantibodies, uh, neonatal stress, and over and over we're seeing evidence, as you can see at the right bottom hand side, that preterm or early term birth increases the risk of autism considerably. Now we had proposed back then that activation of this particular immune cell called the mast cell uh, is important in eventually the uh, pathology sort of moving forward, if you wish. And I will go over a number of pieces of evidence uh, to that extent that involve both inflammation as well as damage uh, to the blood-brain barrier that might allow other triggers to enter into the brain. Now, there are a number of conditions that have been associated with higher risk of autism. And when I say associated, that doesn't mean that one leads to the other, but at least there has been statistical significance in such associations. And I highlighted the ones with the strongest evidence, such as allergy, asthma, atopic dermatitis, or eczema that I will go over, uh, low birth weight or premature birth, which I already mentioned, and stress 
about which I will say a few words. But there are papers uh, indicating that at least in animal models, uh, maternal immune activation has led to the pups, especially rats and mice, uh, developing a phenotype that seems to uh, resemble autism. And there have been a number of studies where maternal autoimmune diseases, especially asthma and allergies, uh, were associated actually with uh, increased risk of autism. Now let's start with food allergies. There are many papers. Uh, one paper was published you know, many, many years ago indicating that there was a strong association with food intolerance, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, uh, recent papers in uh, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, indicated, again, association of food allergy and other allergic conditions with autism. Uh, the European Journal of Pediatrics about a year ago uh, published a paper association of food hypersensitivity. Uh, and then you can see at the bottom another paper about food allergy induces brain inflammatory status and then cognitive impairments. So what, what do we mean by allergy and then food intolerance or food hypersensitivity? Uh, we will revisit that shortly, but in allergy, you literally have specific IgE antibodies against an epitope allergen. Uh, in hypersensitivity, uh, the, you can either have IgG4 subclass of antibodies, or sometimes it might be something in the food that creates no antibodies whatsoever, uh, such as histamine, for instance, and I'll talk about that. So let's think about food allergy and sensitivity in more general terms than the very restrictive term of true allergy. For instance, a paper was published um, in Nature about a year ago, and then it was picked up an editorial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they showed, and you can see in the caricature in the middle, where the mast cells in the gut can release, in this case, histamine, and they invoke the fact that histamine activates histamine 1 receptors on sensitive uh, <clears throat> sensory nerve endings, and that leads to abdominal pain. And of course, you can see different uh, colored dots here, so as we will see later, it might not be just mast cell histamine that does that. So many times the presentation might not be what we would have expected it to be. And we know many children with autism have actually colicky pain, and that might not necessarily associate uh, to frank, let's say, diarrhea uh, or dysbiosis in the gut, might be mast cell activation in the intestine. And as I will try to convince you, mast cells do not have to degranulate, but they can release molecules uh, without necessarily even histamine being uh, released. So having mentioned that, it's important to keep in mind that histamine intolerance has nothing to do with allergy or hypersensitivity. There are many foods that contain histamine, it has nothing to do with mast cells, and that histamine can do whatever histamine does, whether it's actually sensitizing nerve endings or causing activation of receptors. And that is important because we have an enzyme called diamine oxidase, and if one is basically a uh, slow metabolizer, then the diamine oxidase will not be able to break down uh, the histamine of the food. Therefore, it's important to keep in mind the kinds of foods that have a lot of histamine and potentially exclude those foods as we will see later. Now, there are also immune diseases that contribute to the increased risk of autism in the children themselves. So you can see here immune-mediated conditions and autism, uh, immune allergic response in Asperger, and a very critical paper in my mind at the bottom where uh, our colleague from Egypt showed that those about 15% of children that have autoantibodies against brain antigens are the ones that also have allergic problems. So uh, he was the first to link the possibility of autoimmunity to allergic manifestations. But then very large studies have uh, been done with thousands of children where they showed that either maternal or immune diseases uh, can increase the risk or co occurrence of autism and asthma in a very large nationally representative sample in the States uh, or the last uh, paper in the bottom association between atopic dermatitis and autism. So there's no question that there are very strong associations between autoimmunity and specifically what we call atopic diseases. And I like the word atopic because it's much broader than allergy or hypersensitivity. 
So how do we, what are atopic diseases that involve uh, mast cells? Well, we know allergies, of course, uh, and asthma and eczema, but then you can have, as we said, food intolerance, you can have idiopathic itching, you have conditions such as mast cell mediator syndrome that I'll speak about, uh, you know, urticaria pigmentosa, et cetera. But a very critical paper in my mind is the one shown at the bottom, which was published in Science a few years ago, where they convincingly showed that mast cells in the growing baby, in the fetus, are actually responsive to immune IgE circulating in the mother. I and my colleagues have always thought over the years that mast cells actually do not mature until the baby is a few months uh, old uh, or even uh, later. Uh, but they showed that Ig crosses the placenta, it can stimulate mast cells in the fetus, and since the blood-brain barrier has not been formed until about three months of gestation, the brain development might also be affected by whatever might be happening either vis-a-vis -vis the circulating Ig or other potential molecules across the blood-brain barrier and affect the mast cells. Now, what are the mast cells? Muscles were discovered in 1887 by Paul Ehrlich, who got the Nobel Prize. Um, we didn't know then, he didn't know then, but they come actually from hemopoietic precursors. They go through the blood and then they go into the tissues where they quote unquote mature. Interestingly, he was staining tissues with a dye called toluidine blue, and some cells in the tissues turned violet, as you can see at the bottom picture. And some cells were very compact and some cells were sort of more looking swollen and you could identify little dots inside the cell. And he thought that those dots contained molecules that were feeding the surrounding cells. And because in the Greek, the word for breast that feeds the baby is mastos, he calls them mastocytes. As it turns out, uh, he was entirely wrong because the mast cells don't feed any other neighboring cell type, but the term uh, held. Now at about the same time, 1901, Two scientists, Richet and Portier, were doing an experiment out of the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco. They ground up um, uh, tentacles of jellyfish and they were going to inject them into dogs, hoping that the dogs will be actually uh, become immune to subsequent stings of the jellyfish. And they had a term ready for it. They were going to call this protection prophylaxis. When instead what they re-exposed the dogs, the dogs dropped the blood pressure, the bronchi constricted, and they died. So they call that anaphylaxis, as you can see from that stamp from the Principality of Monaco. So even though the cells were discovered in 1887, anaphylaxis was coned in 1901, we did not connect the mast cells to anaphylaxis until about 1947, when histamine was discovered uh, to be present in the mast cell granules. And if you look at the left-hand side of that picture taken again from our laboratory, you can see uh, like a river looking impression going uh, vertical down, that's a blood vessel. And all the dark lines are nerve endings and all the dots are actually mast cells. This picture was taken from the dura, one of the meninges from a rat. And in fact, the dura or the meninges have more mast cells than our skin, yet the meninges don't get allergic reactions. Neither does the brain, as I will get to later. So going back to the uh, facts, each mast cell contains about a thousand or so secretory granules. Each granule contains about 50 active molecules. And during activation, another 50 molecules or so get uh, produced. And yet we only know about histamine and leukotrienes. Uh, and we basically are missing still the forest for the trees. Now. Back in 2015, um, my colleagues and I managed to get a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I was grateful to the journal because they allowed us to use the word mast cells, mastocytosis, about which I'll tell you, and related disorders. So it opened up basically uh, the door to discuss other potential disorders such as autism. The caricature in the middle was also taken from the journal. And as you can see, IG is not even mentioned there. Drugs, peptides, cytokines, environmental triggers can all stimulate the mast cell. And I will tell you what happens when these triggers stimulate the mast cell. <clears throat> so when we talk about mast cell diseases, we uh, separate them into primary, let's say mastocytosis, which is higher number of mast cells uh, from the bone marrow that 
tend to be super active as well. Then we have secondary, which is pretty much what we all know, such as allergies, eczema, physical allergic areas like scratching the skin. And then we have these idiopathic conditions where you can have idiopathic anaphylaxis or angioedema or urticaria and mast cell activation syndrome where the mast cells respond to a whole bunch of triggers unrelated uh, to allergens. Now, uh, this is quite unique in my mind because back in 2009, I published uh, this paper where we showed that the risk of autism in children that had uh, cutaneous mastocytosis was 10 times higher than the general population. That's what got us going and thinking about mast cells and autism long before the epidemiological studies that I shared with you uh, a bit ago. And just to uh, highlight the fact that cutaneous mastocytosis, which is the most common presentation of mastocytosis in children, could be very uh, uh, different. You can see at the right upper hand side, uh, like a, a cafe or less spot, sort of in the nose of this child. Uh, you can see areas that look uh, a little vesicular, but they sometimes are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they look like insect bites. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see uh, where they might be diffuse. Um, so it can be cutaneous diffuse. It can be urticaria pigmentosa with just individual spots, uh, or it can be just solitary mastocytoma. And many times, unless you have diffuse mastocytoma, these are missed by dermatologists. So this slide is a crash course on just the mast cell. If you look at 11 o'clock of the middle caricature, you see specific receptors for IgE. Ig antibodies bind to these high affinity receptors. And when they're bridged by an antigen or some other molecule, a series of reactions takes place, starting with increase of calcium ion flux, and that leads to degranulation. That happens within minutes. And if you see the left-hand side at the bottom, you see the round being the nucleus. Some granules are intact, dark blue, and most of the other granules are light violet as they release their content uh, to the outside. And immediately, within seconds to minutes, you get release of granule stored material, such as um, enzymes like kinase and tryptase, histamine, leukotrienes that are produced very quickly at the time of the degranulation, platelet activating factor, PAF, which I'll tell you a few words about. And the mast cell is the only immune cell that contains preformed tumor necrosis factor. But until a few years ago, there was an oxymoron. The mast cell binds IgE, but the Ig circulates, yet the mast cells don't circulate. So how on earth do they find the IgE? And as you can see, the very important paper at the left-hand side at the top, uh, they showed that perivascular mast cells they throw philopodia through endothelial gaps and they sense the lumen and they bind IgE. So you can see, for instance, a blue-green mast cell in the bifurcation of red blood vessel. And the arrowheads show basically these philopodia that go through the endothelial gaps. So the mast cell not only senses the outside world by virtue of the fact that it is found in the mouth, the skin, the lungs, the gut, but also senses the lumen, and if it can find Ig, obviously can find a whole bunch of other potential triggers. What are these other potential triggers? So if we look at the right-hand side now, this caricature, you can see there are receptors for cytokines, such as interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-33, for peptides, such as neurotensin, CGRP, parathyroid hormone, substance P, and bacteria fungi, as well as viruses, and towards the end of the presentation, I'll say a few words about coronavirus. But what is critical is that when these triggers stimulate the mast cell, it does not undergo degranulation. Instead, it releases inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and peptides, as you can see at the, at the box on the right-hand side. So we have to think of the mast cells participating not only in true allergic reactions by virtue of the fact that it degranulates, but in many other reactions where it can release molecules that are pro-inflammatory without necessarily histamine being released. In addition, the mast cell responds to heavy metals like mercury and aluminum, as well as to herbicides such as atrazine and glyphosate. And in my life, I don't understand why glyphosate is still 
allowed to be sold, at least in the United States, under the name Roundup, because it's been shown to be associated uh, with both autism and dementia and cancer and a whole bunch of other things. Now, in addition, the mast cells do not live in isolation. They communicate with macrophages, they communicate with T cells, and as you can see uh, in the box that moved a little bit higher up, I, it expresses all toll-like receptors. Therefore, as I said earlier, it can be stimulated by all kinds of pathogens. And I chose to show just a few papers. At the top, Borrelia associated with Lyme uh, can stimulate mast cells to release cytokines without degranulation. In the middle, Sporothrix, one of the molds, can stimulate mast cells to release IL-6 and TNF again without degranulation. And we wrote a review of how mycotoxins uh, can be involved in neuropsychiatric uh, problems, including uh, autism, uh, via mast cell activation and release of various molecules. So how do we diagnose atopic diseases? First of all, if I see any dark circles under the eyes of either a child or an adult, I'm assuming they haven't you know, been without sleep for three days, we call this allergic signers that indicates to me that the mast cells are being involved somewhere, even though we haven't identified the problem yet. If you scratch the back or the underarm with either your thumb or some dull object, within a minute, you might get this line, which is dermatographia. That means that the mast cells in the skin responding just to the pressure and releasing histamine and other molecules that are vasodilatory. Again, this happens without necessarily you're being allergic to anything. So I tend to measure total IG as well as subclasses IgG1 and IgG4. Specific because IgG4, as I said earlier, is associated with food intolerance. And as you can see at the upper right hand side corner, a paper showed that increased IgG4 levels uh, was actually uh, found in children with autism, whether they had actually food allergy that was identified with intolerance or not. Uh, if there is chronic itching, then I measure anti ig E receptor antibodies, sometimes we call it basophil activation because 50% uh, of that is autoimmune, actually, urticaria. At the end of the day, because histamine is broken down within a minute, histamine in the blood is literally uh, almost useless. You have to measure the breakdown product, which is either methyl histamine or MIA, uh, methylimidazole acetic acid, that represents about 60% of the breakdown product of histamine or other colleagues have shown that the breakdown product of prostaglandin D2, which is 11 beta PGF2 alpha, is high in 24-hour urine. And I understand it's hard to collect uh, urine, of course, uh, from children. Um, now, uh, colleagues at the Mayo Clinic can use first morning void and still measure uh, these molecules. Now, what is critical is unfortunately it has to be kept cold and sent to the lab cold because if it gets uh, oxidized, then you end up basically empty-handed. Now, if we were to think about atopic diseases in general, and leaving aside, let's say, uh, autism, is there any evidence that atopic diseases contribute to behavioral problems? Well, you can see here allergic diseases in preschoolers have been associated with behavioral problems. A number of papers have shown that uh, they've been uh, associated with ADHD, and of course, some papers, such as the one in the middle, is out of an early child with a risk factor for ADHD or uh, autism. In addition, the question is, if, let's say, allergies is involved uh, or uh, atopic diseases are involved, how does that eventually impact on the brain, especially in children with autism? So we felt very early on that something is happening in the part of the brain, especially amygdala, that regulates fear and stress. And we've published numerous papers showing the psychological stress impacts on mast cells. So the caricature in the middle basically is to show that in a normal individual, normal in quotation, whatever normal is uh, these days, uh, if we get excited, we go into the fight or flight mode. And of course, that becomes uh, sort of pro-inflammatory. Well, if the HPA axis is activated, eventually it might release uh, cortisol, and that's sort of anti-inflammatory. But we've shown, and I show you some evidence, that CRH release under stress together with neurotensin and substance P can 
cause pro-inflammatory effects. And we believe that the amygdala in the brain of the children on the spectrum are literally in this fight or flight mode. And therefore, the brain doesn't pay attention to other higher functions uh, they should be paying attention to because it goes into survival mode. So our effort all along has been, can we kind of change this balance and bring basically the brain into more of a normal state so it's not literally constantly in a fear mode and allow the brain to recover uh, by itself. So how about prenatal stress and risk of autism? Well, there are many papers indicating that there's a very strong association. You can see prenatal development uh, and mental health, prenatal maternal stress and ADHD and autism, prenatal stress and risk of autism, and the, the, one of the recent papers, prenatal stress regardless um, of, uh, uh, in fact, the trimester of pregnancy was associated with uh, increased risk of autism. So we will try to focus on that part of the brain, which is basically the amygdala and the hippocampus that not only regulate uh, stress, uh, but also uh, keeps uh, a memory of the stressful events whether they might have happened you know, a long time ago uh, or not. And the reason why this is important is because we know that about 50% of children do fine until about three years old, and then something happens and they revert uh, and they sort of forget what they learned. And in many cases, there has been a very sort of stressful event at about that time. Now, the stressful event could be psychological or physiological. And Han Seili was one of the first that spoke about the uh, stress uh, event. And, uh, you know, this caricature shows basically that you were always in a, in a, uh, in a fight mode, uh, we might be able to survive, and the brain thinks that it's surviving by being uh, in that fear mode. But prenatal stress not only has been associated uh, with autism and ADHD, but it's associated with allergy and inflammation. Here you see maternal stress and atopic diseases, a um, uh, risk of you know, higher atopic diseases in children, prenatal negative events, increased core blood I, Ig. We have no idea how just a stressful event will increase the Ig. And again, association of maternal uh, stress in any of the trimesters leading to atopic dermatitis. So we have basically asthma, atopic dermatitis, and mast cells. We have stress leading to higher risk of such events and stress leading to higher risk uh, of autism, the whole idea is, can we actually link the two? So back in 1990, I wrote a review about mast cells being the immune gate to the brain. Why? If you look at the caricature in the middle panel, uh, you see that you have endothelial cells, that you have pericytes that make up the blood-brain barrier, and then you have a mast cell. And the electron micrograph is from our laboratory. It's about 250 uh, times uh, magnified. And you see the lumen with an erythrocyte in the lumen. The E is the endothelial cells. The P is the pericyte. And at 11 o'clock, you see a mast cell hugging the blood-brain barrier. And in fact, we've written, and other colleagues have written papers, that the mast cells are found uh, both in the meninges, as well as in the most critical area of the body, the hypothalamus and the amygdala, areas that regulate homeostasis and emotions. And that's why we wrote a couple of reviews, one as back as 2013, that focal inflammation in the brain may be associated with autism, not generalized uh, inflammation in the whole brain. Now, how do you go around proving that? So again, many years ago, what we did is we gave technician blue septate in the tail uh, vein of a mouse, put it into a plexiglass immobilizer. 30 minutes later, we sacrificed uh, the animal, and we look to see if the brain parenchyma contained technetium blue septate. Uh, if the blood brain barrier is intact, no technetium should actually leave the circulation. And as you can see on the blood bar, a lot of technetium blue septate left and went into the brain parenchyma. But when we did this using WW mast cell deficient mice, nothing happened. And when we sacrificed the animals and looked at the brain, you can see cells stained with toluid in blue, mast cells in the hypothalamus, very close to nerve ending stain in gold and brown, uh, which are positive for corticotropin releasing hormone. Then we ran ahead and isolated human mast cells and using a fluorescent antibody against CRH receptor one, 
we showed that the mast cells in green light up like light bulbs. So in spite of what we always thought that CRH is released only from the hypothalamus and affects uh, the pituitary, clearly the mast cells, and as it turns out, many other cells express high affinity receptors. And when we stimulate these uh, cells, they release, as you can see at the graph, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is very vasodilatory. That's the upgoing uh, curve. While there's no tryptase or histamine being released, which are the flat uh, curves. And we show that that induces both brain and skin vascular permeability, especially if corticotropin release hormone is used together with neurotensin. And we also published that this is not a static effect, but the cells are very dynamic. Neurotensin makes the cells grow receptors for CR8 uh, and vice versa. Then we looked at one cytokine called basically interleukin 33. And interleukin-33, together with another molecule called substance P, could induce release of vascular endothelial growth factor. Again, just like neurotensin, substance P induces expression of functional CRH receptors. And other colleagues, uh, colleagues showed when the muscles are activated, they release a molecule called hemokinin-1 that's structurally very similar to substance P. And now the muscles are made to be more responsive to allergic triggers like IgE. That might explain why so many times we and other colleagues uh, see patients that might have had a history of some allergic problem, a little uh, intolerance to certain foods, and then they undergo a major stressful event like you know, surgery, car accident, God forbid someone dies in the family, and all of a sudden are they responsive to everything under the sun. And finally, most recently, we published uh, two papers in the new <clears throat> proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showing that substance B together with L33 increases tremendously the amount of TNF released and also a lot of IL-1 beta released. In fact, such release is higher than any other immune cell that I've known over uh, my career. And that's why we and others have published numerous papers indicating the muscles are involved in inflammation and not only in allergy. And you might ask, how does that happen? if these molecules are not released from mast cell granules. So we published this paper back in 2003. Uh, the graph uh, or the picture on the right-hand side uh, is actually cryo uh, immuno uh, uh, electromicroscopy. So you see about one-tenth of a mast cell and the rectangle shows about 20 black dots. Each dot is a gold particle bound to an antibody that recognizes interleukin-6. So you see basically a bundle of interleukin-6 molecules being released from the mast cell. And what is important is the size of this bundle is the size of a synaptic vesicle. It's 1 20th the size of the secretory granule of the mast cell. You will never see it on light microscopy. That's why we call this differential release. So where does this take us? Clearly, there is brain inflammation. And in addition to what I told you about mast cells and cytokines, there are other molecules that we don't have time to talk about, such as microtoxins, uh, such as viruses, uh, et cetera. So we have to keep in mind that the trigger of potential inflammation in that part of the brain might not only be due uh, to what I've told you uh, so far. So is all inflammation the same? Obviously not, yet we unfortunately talk about inflammation interchangeably. You know, if we have systemic inflammation, we have sepsis. If you've got uh, inflammation of the skin, you've got the psoriasis. If you've got, uh, you know, inflammation of the meninges, you get meningitis, so forth and so on. So we should try to avoid using broad terms, which unfortunately are used in reviews, as you will see shortly. So I tend to measure pro-inflammatory molecules, especially S100, which is otherwise called calprotectin, as well as anti-inflammatory motory molecules, because at the end is the balance uh, of the two that might make the difference. And as I just told you, a number of reviews have shown up using various and different terms that can be very confusing, such as immune mediators in the brain. Well, immune mediators could be good or bad, so that doesn't tell us very much. Autism and intellectual disability associated with increased levels of maternal cytokines and chemokines during gestation relevance of neuroinflammation and encephalitis. That's a wrong term. We do not have uh, encephalitis uh, in autism. 
So another paper, autoimmune encephalitis. Again, we don't have encephalitis. The whole brain is not involved. And then inflammatory cytokines, potential biomarkers uh, in immune dysfunction. So we have to try to be as careful as we can in terms of where is the inflammation, what are the molecules are being involved, because that might lead us to potential uh, treatment approaches. But mast cells are very few in the brain, even though they're found, as I said, in the meninges uh, and the area of hypothalamus, uh, amygdala, hippocampus. The most abundant immune cells in the brain are the microglia. The brain does not have immune cells. In fact, the circulating immune cells should never get into the brain because if they do, the first thing they see is myelin, they destroy it. And that's how you get multiple sclerosis. So a number of papers have shown over the years that the microglia are involved and activated in autism. There was a paper back in 2014 talking about glia and autism disorders, uh, then abroma microglia, spatial organization uh, in the cortex, and then two very important papers published in Nature Communications. One showed that transcripts of microglia were shown to be elevated, and then also protein synthesis in microglia at the bottom. Can we see microglia activation visually? The only way to do it is with SPECT scan, which is single positron emission uh, computing tomography. Here, as you see, uh, brains. Uh, a, a part of the brain of a normal individual, cerebellum, brain thalamus, with just a few uh, areas uh, light up. These are microglia. And at the bottom, you see how uh, many microglia are activated in a brain of an autistic uh, individual. So we invoke the fact that mast cells talk to microglia, either directly or by breaking down the blood brain barrier and allowing other molecules to come in and activate microglia. Is that possible. Well, other colleagues have published that before we even did. You can see role of mast cells in neuroinflammation, microglia and mast cells and neuroinflammation. And most importantly, at the bottom, microglia activation by various mediators released from mast cells. And at the right-hand side, at the bottom, especially tryptase, this unique enzyme found only in mast cells. So what did we do? First, we tried to look at peptides that might activate mast cells and microglia and whether they might be found in the blood of patients. Now you might ask, why blood? I mean, if it's happening in the brain, why would you bother with blood? Our hope was that if a child doesn't have any other condition to basically suggest that there should be increase of any neuropeptide, we might pick it up. So we tested about 20 neuropeptides and only two showed up to be increased. As you can see, one was neurotensin. You see the graph? Uh, so about 50% in the center panel of the children had high neurotensin. At the right-hand side, another cohort from the United States, I'm not showing you the graph, showed that there was elevation of neurotensin and corticotropin release hormone. And I already showed you earlier the neurotensin and CRH check together to open up the blood-brain barrier. So then we looked at cultured, embryonic human microglia. And we showed that when we add neurotensin to the microglia, they actually grow receptors for neurotensin. And the receptors are shown in green uh, in the middle panel. And then what we did is we cultured this human embryonic microglia. We stimulate them with neurotensin. And we measured output of interleukin-1 beta. And we use either primary or immortalized microglia. And as you can see in both cases, there was a lot of interleukin-1 beta being released from this microglia. So then we decided to go into the brain and we took uh, basically samples from uh, a brain bank in uh, the University of Maryland. And we sampled the cortex or the amygdala. And if you look at the right-hand side uh, graph, we measured interleukin-38, which is basically an anti-inflammatory molecule and the receptor for interleukin-38. And as you can see, as compared to non-autistic controls, both the actual anti-inflammatory molecule was down as well as the receptor for this molecule was down. So it appeared that not only there's inflammation in the brain, but the only anti-inflammatory molecule known was also down. So was, we have a double whammy basically. So then we culture microglia again, we stimulate them with neurotensin, but now we pre-treated them with different uh, types of interleukin-38 and as you can see, one particular 
uh, type block this response 100%. So potentially, if we can make the brain make interleukin-38, we can deliver interleukin-38 to the brain, we might be able to actually change uh, the situation. But unfortunately, interleukin-38 is not available for treatment as of yet. And another paper recently published that genes expressed in the amygdala were associated, in fact, with autism, supporting uh, our own findings that were published in uh, PNAS. At the same time, we and our colleagues uh, have shown additional evidence uh, that mast cell uh, is involved and molecules from mast cells may be involved. In the right-hand side panel, with samples again from the brain, we showed that interleukin-18, which stays much longer time-wise than interleukin-1 or interleukin-6, is increased in only in the amygdala of patients with autism. And you can see that tumor necrosis factor was also increased. At the middle panel, you can see that there are more microglia uh, in the brain of autistic children than controls. And in the high, lower middle panel, uh, you can see that there are many more mast cells, and you can see the mast cells are double stained with tryptase, so you can see them actually showing up as blue cells. And then we measured an enzyme uh, that is released from mast cells that makes metalloproteinase. And MMP9 is important because it can destroy the scaffolding in the brain that allows synapses basically to form. And as you can see, in children with autism, uh, there's actually more of this enzyme indicating that the muscles are releasing the enzyme that might be destroying uh, the scaffold in the brain. So what do we do for treatment? Well, I tend to actually look for some, if you can call it anatomic problems first. And I've seen, unfortunately, that in a number of children, there might be actually inflammation in the hypothesis or the medium eminence, the stock between the uh, hypothalamus and the pituitary, sometimes the pituitary adenoma, especially if there are headaches, double vision, and other such problems. Otherwise, the first thing to do is to at least avoid potential triggers such as allergens, colorings, you know, various foods. And it's important because it is the ripe avocado or tomatoes uh, or nectarines uh, that actually have a lot of histamine. So we try to avoid that and clearly avoid uh, mold. We've also found that various preservatives such as polyethylene glyco, which is found actually in the mRNA vaccines, PEG, uh, silicone, talc 280 can also be uh, triggers. Now, if we have obviously problems with histamine, we tend to think about histamine one receptor antagonist, antihistamines. Obviously there are many antihistamines, but one antihistamine, rupatadine, which is not available in the United States, but is available actually <clears throat> in the UK under the name of uh, rupafin is both an antihistamine, it's antiplatelet activating factor, and it's a muscle inhibitor. And as you can see on the left-hand side, we published two papers years back that rupatadine can inhibit mast cell activation by different stimuli, as well as activation by platelet activating factor. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Marr from Charité in Berlin, published a paper, a double-blind study, where it showed that it was very useful in mastocytosis. However, too much of something is not necessarily good. Histamine is very important in our brain. Uh, you see at the top that histamine is important in motivation. Other papers have shown that it's important in learning. And I wrote a review about histamines and mental status. If you push the antihistamines, you block the histamine in the brain, you start getting problems like brain fog and, and, and uh, uh, cognitive uh, problems. And the FDA in the United States about a year ago published basically a warning because a whole bunch of silly teenagers were overdosing on uh, Benadryl, which is dynephenhydramine, and they ended up basically in coma in emergency rooms. So just, again, be aware of the fact that too much of antihistamines or if anything is not necessarily the best. Now, I always look for polymorphisms for certain genes. Diamine oxidase, because it breaks down histamine, MTHFR because it takes folic acid and makes active folic acid. And many children with autism have actually mutations on MTHFR. Uh, I look for COMT, catecholamine ultramethyltransferase, that breaks down catecholamines and uh, phenols. 
and then the well-known CYP3 uh, enzymes that metabolize most drugs. And it's important because I'll tell you about uh, polyphenols in the next few minutes, uh, such as you know flavonoids. And many colleagues think again that too much of you know if we give actually two grams of polyphenols, we'll be doing you know great, and that's not true. Polyphenols accumulate in the gut, they shut down the microbiota in the gut, and you end up with dysbiosis and you start chasing uh, your tail. So winding down, we've been studying flavonoids for many years. And one paper was published in 2000. It's been actually a classic in pharmacology. We found over the years that luteolin is probably the most effective uh, such uh, flavonoid. And you can see reviews where it's antioxidant. It can inhibit L6 production of the brain. And in a nutshell, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory muscle inhibitor, microglia inhibitor, and neuroprotective. So you can't go wrong. You've got at least five birds with one uh, stone. Have there been any studies? Two studies, are uh, open label, both of them were, were done, one in, in Greece, the other in the United States, and uh, basically using a lot of different ways of following the children. The bottom line was that within four months, children gained the equivalent of 1.5 years in development. And at the bottom graph, we actually measured interleukin-6 um, uh, actually at the beginning. So you see how the controls were very low, ASD children have higher, about 50% of the children. And then this is the same baseline moved now to the right. We started them on uh, the supplement. And then three months later, we measured uh, interleukin-6 again, as you can see, is actually way down even below control. So about 50% of the children that had high IL-6 were the ones that did actually better. As you can see in the graphs with the green. So everybody got better within three months, but the ones that we can measure in the blood, high L6, were the ones that actually got better and AL6 dropped. So one could have an index of objective uh, measurement for at least half the children. So I helped uh, develop actually certain of these supplements. And the reason I'm mentioning this is not to tell you so much about the supplements, but to give you some uh, uh, tips that are very important. I already told you, about the fact that polyphenols accumulate in the gut. I never use more than one uh, and a half grams of any flavonoid because they are absorbed less than 10%. They accumulate in the gut, they shut down the gut. So in these formulations, we used olive seed oil. So if you take the olive oil, you're left with a pit. If you cross the pit, you get a little thicker oil. And that is very important because we create liposomes and increase the absorption about five times. And once we started talking and making these supplements available, a number of other companies produced luteolin supplements that prompted me to write this review, luteolin supplements, all the glitters is not gold. Because if you open up some of these supplements, they're not even yellow and luteolin is yellow, so they have nothing there. Or they use rutin, which is 20 times you know, cheaper almost uh, than, than um, uh, luteolin, but rutin doesn't have any effect. So you've got to be very aware of what you're actually here using. And most importantly, even though the FDA in the United States cannot regulate supplements, if you export them and you ask them voluntarily to, number one, check if the company, in this case, the company is called Algonaut, is FDA registered, which it is. If the source and the purity is measuring an independent uh, uh, laboratory, and if you have a clinical trial, even though it's not double blind, then they give you the certificate. As you can see, it says you as Food and Drug Administration. It's called Certificate of Free Sale, and it's renewable every two years. So it's important to know that what you're eventually uh, suggesting to your uh, patients are of as good quality as it can be. Now, many children cannot swallow capsules, as we all know. And uh, many patients were actually making a little hole and squeezing the content out. In about two weeks, uh, there will be now what is called Neuroprotec low phenol liquid formula. It will be small bottles basically with a dropper. And now one can use the dropper. So the one dropper will be equivalent of one capsule. And you can put it literally under the tongue. And as we know, if you put it under the tongue, you have almost sublingual. And you have better absorption. You avoid the problems that I told you of absorbability from the gut. And the addition is that all of this formulation 
uh, is in olive oil. And here's one of many papers of anti-inflammatory activities of olive oil polyphenols. So we add up the additional benefit of the polyphenols in the olive oil. So I wrote a paper uh, about a year ago about ways to address perinatal muscle activation, focal bearing inflammation. And I said a little bit about coronavirus and I will finish with three or so slides talking about coronavirus. So what, I, what do I do? So first, it's very important in my mind to address hyperactivity. About 80% of the children I've ever actually dealt with are hyperactive, and yet hyperactivity is not part of the diagnosis of autism. If I don't bring the hyperactivity down, things are very difficult. So I usually start with ashwagandha or chamomile passiflora valerian extract, except for the valerian extract is a little bitter, so you have to watch out. If those don't work, then you can go to drugs such as hydroxyzine, which is a sedating antihistamine, such as propranolol or clonidine. Uh, in terms of the inflammation, luteolin, as I've already told you, is important. Rupatadine, because it inhibits muscle cells, is important. And vitamin D3 is quite anti-inflammatory. And I usually uh, uh, recommend 500 to 2,000 units per day. If there are mutations in the MTHFR gene, then we bypass it by using either folium uh, folinate calcium or calcium folinate or methylfolate uh, or glutathione, except the glutathione right now might be removed from the market in the United States for reasons that are not uh, quite apparent. But in the meantime, we discovered another natural flavonoid, which is very similar to luteolin, but instead of four hydroxy groups, it has four methyl groups. So it's a tetramethoxy flavon. And as you can see at the top, uh, we show that it's a much better inhibitor of mast cells. Uh, in the middle uh, figure, we stimulate the muscles with substance P. We measure the enzyme beta hexosaminidase being released. And you can see chromolin, which is supposed to be a mast cell inhibitor, is inhibiting about 15%, luteolin about 60%, and methoxyluteolin almost 100%. In another paper published in PNAS, you see a dose response. The upper curve is luteolin, the lower curve is methoxyluteolin. And as you can see, as we push the concentration, we inhibit release of interleukin 1 beta in response to neurotensin almost 100%. We went ahead and showed how that works. When the muscles of the microglia get triggered, calcium flows in, various um, uh, enzymes are activated, and eventually a complex called mammalian target of rapamycin gets activated. And it's got its name from the antibiotic rapamycin. We measure the activation of this complex by phosphorylation of downstream events. And as you can see in the middle panel, neurotensin stimulates the two downstream events. Beta actin at the bottom is the home keeping gene. Rapamycin, as you can see, it did not block the first substrate. It reduced the second substrate, but treatment with methoxyluteolin reduced the first substrate and block the second substrate. So technically methoxyluteolin is better inhibitor of mTOR than even rapamycin, they gave its name to it. And we went ahead and made basically a skin lotion containing methoxyluteolin because by virtue of the fact that it has methyl groups, it has no color. The color in all the flavonoids due to the number of hydroxy groups uh, that are available. So as you can see, we made a cream called Gentle Derm. It's entirely hypoallergenic. Uh, it's very hydrating. Uh, it's good for anybody that has eczema or psoriasis. But many families rub basically the skin lotion on the forehead and they get absorption basically into the temporal vessels. So that in association with luteolin by mouth seems to be doing uh, the best effect. So how does that tie in for the potential that the coronavirus might be a trigger for the microglia or the mast cells? So we made this caricature that was published uh, in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry uh, about a year ago or so. And we hypothesized that the coronavirus can enter the brain through the nose, uh, up the olfactory nerve, where it can stimulate either the mast cells or the microglia or both, and potentially luteolin can inhibit that. Is there any evidence to that? Well, first, we published a number of papers about the association of muscles with coronavirus, and you'll see some more evidence in uh, one slide coming up. But there is evidence, as you can see in the middle panel, about neurologic involvement in children and adolescents following COVID-19. 
And in fact, the large organization, New York Simons Foundation, uh, has funded a longitudinal study of mothers that got sick with COVID-19 and the potential risk of autism. This is going on for another two years. We don't know the results as of yet. So obviously others were very interested in the potential association. But before we even talk about the brain, there was evidence that the muscles are involved, especially in the lungs. And at the end of the day, it is failure of the lungs that ends with patients being intubated and eventually, unfortunately, dying. We know muscles are plentiful in the lungs because they're involved in asthma. So everything that is released in the lungs, such as cytokines, uh, a platelet activating factor, can cause edema, inflammation, and microemboli. And both we and others publish that platelet activating factor might be involved in the microemboli seen in the lungs. Two papers on the right hand side published about a year ago uh, showed that the mast cells in the lungs of patients that had died were activated. And interestingly enough, eosinophilic cationic protein, which is of course released from eosinophils, but it's a very important trigger of mast cells, uh, was high. And so was an enzyme called chymase, which is released from mast cell granules, but we don't pay too much attention to it. I'll say a word about that. And then recently, a number of papers, reviews, have been showing up about cytokine storms and functional role of mast cells. Now, this is a paper that we just uh, published, and it's, it's very important because they immunize mice against co coronavirus. They infected, I should say, mice with coronavirus. And you can see in the lungs at the upper uh, left-hand side, sort of middle panel, the mast cells are intact. But in the mice that were infected, the muscles are degranulated. And when they measure chymase in their blood, you can see day one, day three, chymase was very high. Then they went to patients and they looked at non-COVID. Uh, you can see where the bar is, the horizontal bar. Then community, meaning as asymptomatic, the inpatient was higher and intubated was very much higher. Now, what is important is not only that this tracked with disease severity, but chymase is in itself an angiotensin converting enzyme. In fact, it's not even blocked by the uh, inhibitor such as captopril. But remember that the receptor for the coronavirus is angiotensin converting enzyme type two. So the release of chymase might have a lot to do with the receptor, the expression of the receptor, et cetera. And no one has studied that yet. However, I've been very interested in long COVID syndrome because about 50% uh, of patients with COVID end up getting long COVID, which is characterized by per primarily brain fog. In the uh, lower uh, hand side uh, paper, this was a Mediterranean study in seven countries uh, in, in Europe, and they showed about 50% of the people uh, got long COVID irrespective of the severity of the original infection. And many papers have been showing that glial cells are involved. If you look at the left-hand side at the bottom, this paper showed that the spike protein could actually stimulate microglia. And the graph at the right-hand side, which is not published from our laboratory, shows that the full-length spike protein could stimulate interleukin-1 uh, release from human cultured microglia, but not the receptor binding domain. This tells me that the ACE2 receptor may not be involved but potentially some toll-like receptors might be involved. And the slide before the last, we published a paper in um, molecular neurobiology where we basically discussed all the evidence that the spike protein by itself may be responsible for what happens to the brain, whether it's autism or long COVID syndrome. Why? Because no one has shown infection of brain cells with coronavirus. Now, there are two papers, you can see on the right-hand side, where the spike protein can cross the blood-brain barrier, and just below that, that the spike protein can damage the blood-brain barrier. So going to the left-hand side from our own paper, we invoke the fact that both the coronavirus could enter if the blood-brain barrier is damaged, or the spike protein can damage the blood-brain barrier and enter, where then it will activate mast cells and microglia in ways that I've been telling you. So if you look at the lower right-hand side, if this is a caricature of S cell, it could be the mast cell, the microglial cell, or a neuron, 
Basically, the spike protein can stimulate either toll-like receptors or the ACE2 receptor or heparin sulfate, which is sticking out of the surface of the cells, which is a core receptor for the spike protein. And then molecules such as luteolin, methoxyluteolin, or quercetin uh, can block TLR, TLR receptors, can block the ACE2 receptor, and it can block downstream events such as the inflammasome, mTOR, uh, serine protease, which cleaves basically the spike, spike protein allows uh, the virus to enter. So obviously the more areas that we can block, the better the potential benefit uh, will be. And this is the final uh, slide. Two points I want to make with the slide. Number one, as I told you early on, that the mast cells in the growing fetus are active. So can they respond to Ig? They can respond to coronavirus in the mother, can respond to mycotoxins that the mother has been exposed to, etc. Can stimulate the mast cells both in the periphery and in the brain. Blood-brain barrier is not actually intact until about three months of gestation. So God knows what can happen to the developing brain during that critical first uh, trimester. And then, as I said, potentially flavonoids like luteolin can block that. Number two, there are now papers from long ago and recent ones, such as the one shown in the middle panel, models of fetal brain injury, intrauterine inflammation, and preterm birth. We just have to revisit now such models because I believe a lot is happening during gestation uh, that might lead to high risk of autism. And for better or worse, we uh, were awarded a number of US patents uh, as you can see there, for the possibility that combination of such flavonoids might have a beneficial effect early in life as well as later. I went very quickly. I covered a lot of material. I hope that some of the material was new to you, and I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions. Great. Many thanks for your talk, um, Bea Harris. I'm just going to stop the recording now. Okay.